Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the scriptures teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, good to have everybody. And uh, again, I can never express enough appreciation for you folk who come in for the studio audience because I've said so often I, I couldn't teach just to the camera. But uh, for all of you joining us on television, how we appreciate your letters. And uh, well, I guess there are several statements that people make over and over, but one of which is I feel like I'm sitting right there in the studio. Well, that's exactly, and I gotta give the camera guys credit for some of that. But uh, anyway, we're glad that uh, you've tuned in and we trust that You'll study with us, and as I said in the last program, we're not trying to twist arms or try to condemn anybody. Or we're not going to attack anyone, but we're just going to hopefully teach the Word and let the Word do its own work. And we have experienced that it can do just exactly that. So for those of you out in television, all the past programs, of course, are available on videotape, audio tape, and the little booklets are on the, uh, on the picture. And... Uh, those of you who watched our last program when we went over the timeline, be aware that it is in every little book, isn't it? And uh, the timeline, I think, is so self-explanatory how that everything just unfolded and fell into place. And the thing we have to understand is that the church age was never revealed until the Apostle Paul. And uh, consequently, there's nothing of the church in the Old Testament or the Gospels and we have to realize that doctrinally the church has to go to the letters of Paul for its faith and practice. And that just solves a multitude of problems and confusion because, oh, I could just give you example after example of people who call and say, well, I always thought the Bible was contradictory, but when you show the difference between law and grace, between Israel and the church age, that settles it all because it's not contradictory, it's just a change of modus operandi. Naturally, law was a whole different program and it was a works religion. But grace, it's all of grace and not of works as we will see now especially as we get into Paul's letter to the Galatians. Now again, I've stressed so often, especially back when we started uh, Paul's letters in Romans, that all of Paul's letters, even though they are not in chronological order, nowhere near it, because actually the first and second Thessalonian letters were written first, and uh, then probably Galatians and uh, Romans, and then perhaps the Corinthians, those are all pretty close together. And then later on, the, the prison epistles, of course, of uh, First and Second Timothy, and well, not even earlier than that, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Philemon, and the Timothys and the Titus were written toward the end of his ministry. But the point I always like to make, to, to just reaffirm that the Holy Spirit was definitely on this man's apostleship, that in every every single manuscript of the New Testament that is still somewhere on the world, museums, libraries, or whatever, in every one, Paul's letters are always in the same order that they are in our New Testament today. Other books of the Bible, of the New Testament may be in various order, but Paul's letters are always exactly as we have them today. And I think that just again, confirms the fact that the Holy Spirit was in such total control of what this man had accomplished. All right, now for those of you who have been studying with us all the way through the Corinthian letters, you'll remember, I almost said it so often I was afraid people would just sort of blink and say, no, not again. But Paul is always defending his apostleship because he was under constant attack primarily by the Judaizers that he was an imposter, that he had turned his back. He, he was just a turncoat against the traditions of the fathers. And then they even came so far as to say, well, you didn't have the authority that Peter had because you didn't walk with Christ for three years like Peter did. And so he was under that constant attack for both reasonings. You are a turncoat to Judaism 
And on the other hand, you haven't got the authority that Peter and the twelve had because they walked with Jesus for three years. You didn't. And so he is always coming back and saying, as we saw in our uh, closing chapters of 2 Corinthians. In fact, I want you to go back again for just a little bit of a review because even as we go into Galatians, the first thing he's going to declare that he was an apostle, not declared such by any group of men, but by God himself. All right, you're back in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And even as I taught it on the program, it, it made such an impact on me that I've been sharing it with most of my classes here in Oklahoma. But I, I think it's just so amazing that three times in these two chapters, so actually it's in a course of about one full chapter, but you drop in first at 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 5 because I'm still setting the stage for his letter to the Galatians. <clears throat> and look what he writes. For I suppose, now this is Holy Spirit inspired. This isn't just Paul writing from his own spirit. This is the inspired word of God. And he says, I suppose I was not a whit behind the very chiefest apostles. Well, who was the chiefest apostle? Well, Peter was, and he's not letting Peter have a half a foot advantage on him. He says, I'm not one whit behind the chiefest apostles. All right, skip over into chapter, in this chapter 11, verse 23. In fact, drop up to verse 22. Are they Hebrews? Well, who do you suppose he's talking about? Well, I think he's talking about the 12 back there in Jerusalem who his Gentile people are being told by Judaizers, well, this guy wasn't ever with Peter. This guy didn't ever spend three years with Jesus. How can you listen to him? You see? But now look what he says in verse 22. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? Oh, I speak as a fool. Now he realizes that he's saying something that, that may seem a little bit braggadocia, but on the other hand, he knows he's inspired by the Spirit to write, I am what? More. You see that? This apostle says that he was more than those back there at Jerusalem. More in labor, more abundant in stripes above measure, in prison more frequent, in deaths often. And then he goes on to show how he suffered for the sake of the gospel, the likes of which Peter, James, and John never did. All right, now you come on into chapter 12. And like I said, it's almost within the scope of one chapter had it not been broken by our chapter headings. And of course, it wasn't when Paul wrote it. Now you drop down to chapter 12, verse 11. A third time in a course of just a few verses, I am become a fool in glorying. In other words, he didn't like to have to bring up his own credentials. But like he told the Corinthians, I have to, because you are trying to put me down as of no count. And so I have to let you know my authority as an apostle. All right, I am become a fool in glorying. You have compelled me, for I ought to have been commended of you. Remember when we were teaching this a few weeks ago? How we pointed out that those Corinthians came out of their paganism, not because of the preaching of the Twelve in Jerusalem, but because of this man's loyalty to Christ. And so he says, For in nothing am I behind the very chiefest apostles. Quite a statement, isn't it? I am not one whit behind the very chiefest of the apostles. Though he says in myself, he's what? He's nothing. He knew that. He never took any of the credit. But he has to constantly affirm his apostleship. And this is what we have to overcome in this day and age just as much as he had to when he was writing it. And I've stressed it on this program over and over how many how many theologians and pastors and preachers and ministers totally ignore this man's writings. They just almost treat it like a plague. 
And yet, this is where we have to be if we're going to know the truth of God for this age of grace. All right? And so the Galatians, as we pointed out in our couple programs back, Galatia was that central part of what is today the land of Turkey. And it was probably in the southern half of Galatia that Paul had his first bad experiences on his first missionary journey when he visited the cities of Antioch, Pisidia, and Derby and Lystra. And you remember it was between Derby and Lystra that he had the stoning episode. But here he writes to this group of little churches that he had no doubt planted himself and who were now being bombarded by again the Judaizers, the Jewish element from Jerusalem, whether it was the Orthodox who still rejected Jesus of Nazareth, or whether it was the Judaizers who had embraced Christ as the Messiah, I don't think it makes much difference because they both were hung up on the fact that you had to keep the law and you had to practice circumcision or you couldn't be saved. So these Judaizers were coming into these little congregations that Paul had been able to uh, plant through his sweat and blood and tears, and now they're telling them, you can't be saved by Paul's message alone. You can't be saved like he says. You've got to be circumcised. You've got to keep the law. And they just couldn't get it out of their crawl. Let me show what I'm talking about. Now, we're going to see it in Galatians chapter 2, but I don't think we're going to get there in this series anyway. Come back to Acts chapter 15, because I think most church people, when I say church people, I mean people who regularly attend church and Sunday school, most of them don't know that this is in their Bible. I, I know from the folks that, that come into my classes from time to time. All right, but in Acts chapter 15, and this says it so clearly. I don't have to explain it. Acts 15, verse 1. And remember now, this is about 52 A.D. This is some, oh, 12 years after Peter's going to the house of Cornelius. This is some 15 years after Paul's own experience on the road to Damascus. So time has been moving on. This isn't just the day after Pentecost. This is years later, and look what the Scripture says. Verse 1 of 15, And certain men who came down from Judea, that's Jerusalem, taught the brethren. See, they somehow wiggled their way in. And they taught the brethren, these converts of Paul who had recently come out of paganism. But these Judaizers said, Except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. See how plain that is? And then jump up to verse 5 in this same chapter. But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees who believed. See? Now these are people who had believed that Jesus was the Messiah. All right? But they were Pharisees, but they were believing Pharisees. And they said that it was needful to circumcise them. Why? Because they're Gentiles, but they had embraced Paul's gospel, and now they're trying to pervert it, and so that it was needful to circumcise them and to, what's the next word? Command them. See? Now, they didn't just suggest, now, wait a minute, maybe you can be a better follower of Christ if you would just keep the law and so No, no. They commanded it. And when they commanded it, they were attaching salvation to it, see? And so they commanded them to keep the law of Moses. Now, that's what your Bible says. I know it does. I don't care what translation you got. They can't foul it up that much because it's so simple. Now, I know some of them do a pretty good job, but I, I hope they didn't on this verse. All right, now then you come back to Galatians. Here the apostle now is getting word and I think he's probably back at Corinth, if I'm not mistaken. And it's about 60 A.D. Now, just figure real fast. 60 A.D. And if Saul was converted, I think, about 37 and began his ministry in about 40 A.D., so 20 years after he has begun his ministry to the Gentiles, he now is getting word that these little congregations up there in central Turkey, which was Galatia, are being bombarded 
to go back under the law. And so this little book of Galatians is written to correct that false teaching and to bring them back under the pure grace of God. And listen, it's just as appropriate for the world today as it was then. And I'm even speaking of the world of church people. All right? So now he is writing to these people. And we looked at a little bit of this a couple programs ago, but we'll just skim over it for that reason. So Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man. In other words, the Antioch church didn't commission him an apostle. The Jerusalem church didn't commission him. God did. But by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him, Christ, from the dead, and all the brethren who are with me, now that would probably include uh, Luke, and uh, at this time I suppose it's already Silas instead of Barnabas, and probably Timothy. All right. Grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Now I've got to make a point up there in verse 2. Because of their giving in to false teaching, Paul leaves an important part out of his address to the Galatian churches. Now you're not going to catch it unless I tell you. I know you won't. All right, verse 2. He's writing to all the brethren who are with me unto the churches of Galatia. Something lacking? Oh, hey, come back to Romans. Just for an example, come back to Romans. Let's just compare Scripture with Scripture. That's the only way you learn these things. And it's a, it's a subtle way of telling us how far these Galatian churches had already degenerated because of a perverted gospel. All right, in Romans chapter 1, uh, verse 6. Verse 7, to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. See that? Now that's quite a commendation, isn't it? He is commending the Romans for that kind of a position. All right, let's go look at the Corinthians. I'm pretty sure it's in there. I'm, I'm kind of going free fall here, but uh, 1 Corinthians. Verse 2, yeah, Jerry's even ahead of me. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2, unto the church of God which is at Corinth, to them who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called <coughs> to be saints. Did you ever see that before? Most people don't. Called to be saints. And with all that are in every place calling upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, I don't know whether 2 Corinthians does it or not, but uh, let's look at it a minute because this is just an informal Bible study. Yeah, to a degree. Verse one, chapter 1, verse 1 of 2 Corinthians, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, unto the church of God which is at Corinth, and with all the saints. You see how he is placing, now, even the Corinthian church. Now you remember when we studied Corinthians, what kind of a church were they? Carnal, fleshly. See? All right. Now let's go on past Galatians a little bit and let's go to Ephesians. And then this will be far enough. I think I've made my point. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1. Ephesians chapter 1. Verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints who are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. See that? All right, now come back and then look at the Galatian letter again. And now he says to the brethren who are with me and unto the churches of Galatia. Isn't that something? Nothing about them being the church of God, or the saints, or those who are in Christ, now they have become the churches of Galatia. You know, when I was first seeing this some time ago, it reminded me of God's attitude toward Israel back when he was writing to Daniel. 
And even a lot of times when he spoke to Daniel, how did he refer to the nation of Israel? Thy people. Remember that? Thy people. He didn't call them my people. Why? Because they had degenerated so far from their love for Jehovah that God wasn't even really claiming them. They were Daniel's people. They were Moses' people. But he didn't say my people like he did at the beginning. See, he, he called them my people. And he will again, of course, when Israel finally responds at his second coming. Then he will say, according to the new covenant, it is my... Let me make a point. Come back to Jeremiah. My, it's the only way we learn. Jeremiah... Chapter 31, yeah, verse 33. I've often said, someday I'm going to get in trouble doing this, but uh, Jeremiah 31, verse 33. Because this is a point I want you to see. But this, Paul, uh, Jeremiah writes, with regard to the new covenant, but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be what? My people. No, they're not tonight. God doesn't call Israel my people tonight. They're far from him. Oh, they may be religious, but they're not God's people per se. But the day is coming. They will be. Oh, listen, God's not through with Israel. Don't you believe some of this garbage that God has completely forgotten his covenant promises. That's all it is. But he is yet going to complete his prophetic program as we had it on the board. It's still going to be fulfilled. Prophecy cannot Stop in mid-place. It's going to be fulfilled. All right, now then, if you'll flip back quickly to Galatians. And uh, now then, verse 3 again. Grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. And here comes Paul's major message throughout all of his letters. How that Christ gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. And now here we come to the crux of this letter. How he has to correct. Now you know what it means to correct. If we've got a rocket heading out into space for a particular orbit, and for some reason or other it, it gets off track a little bit, what do they have to do? Well, they've got to get busy with their old computers and bring it back on course, or it's a disaster. Well, same way here. The Galatians were off course, and the whole purpose of this little six-chapter book is to correct and bring them back, and bring them back to a knowledge of the truth and come away from the false teaching that was besieging them. All right, so verse 6 of Galatians 1, I marvel, or I'm amazed, Paul said, that you are so soon removed from him who called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Another gospel. And yet he goes on to say in the next verse, it's not really another one, it's not a totally different one, but it's the same gospel that he had used in establishing them but now it was being what? Perverted. Perverted. Polluted. Remember, again, let's go back to Corinthians. My, I just happened to run across this last night, uh, and I thought, well, this might be a good place to compare Scripture with Scripture again. 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Otherwise, you forget everything I ever taught you. We've just got to keep going back and forth. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, and my wife's looking, wants to see what verse. Well, verse 17, honey. Verse 17, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 17, for he says, Paul writing to the Corinthians, remember, verse 17, for we are not as many who corrupt, see that, who corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. Now, you remember when we were studying this, I took you back to Isaiah chapter 1, verse 20. 
too, because it explains it so graphically. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 22, and it's in such simple language. My land, kids can understand this. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 22. And see, the Jews understood all this, that this was part of their everyday experience. And this is exactly what Paul is referring to when he said he didn't do this with his spiritual commission. All right, you got it? Thy silver is become dross, thy wine mixed with what? What does water do to wine? Now, I'm not a buff on wine, but I can just about imagine that if you've got an expensive French wine and you water, uh, water it down with water, what have you got? Well, you've got something that probably isn't even worth trying to swallow. All right, what was, what was the illusion? That somebody was corrupting them. And that's what exactly what he's talking about back here in Galatians. Now, we only got one minute left, so come back here quickly. So he said, verse 7, you're not falling for a totally different gospel, but there are some that would pollute or corrupt or like mixing water with wine. That's what they are doing to Paul's gospel. Why? Because Paul's gospel says you are saved by faith plus how much? <laughs> Nothing. And yet these Judaizers are coming in and saying, you can't be saved that way. You have to, yes, you can believe what Paul told, but you have to also practice circumcision and you have to keep the law of Moses or you can't be saved. Now what is that? That's a pollution. That's a corruption of the truth. And so this is why Paul had to write this whole letter to the Galatians, was to correct them from this error of believing something that was corrupt because it was perverted. We want to invite you to visit lessfeldick.com where you'll find all our programs available on audio, video, and in book form. You'll also find many of our on-location teaching seminars held across the country, as well as the popular questions and answers book and many other study materials. Just go to lessfeldick.com. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. Or call 1-800-369-7856. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.